down by Christian monks. Um, the original oral poems were, there are still remnants of some of them on rune stones, etc., throughout uh, Scandinavia. But we, we know that they were altered slightly by the Christian monks when they were writing them down. Um, and it's written in a language uh, known as Old Icelandic, which is just a version of Old Norse. There are, in, in the manuscript, there are, well, the manuscript is actually about the size of a fat sort of romantic paperback. And it's unadorned, um, just a bunch of soot in the margins. Uh, underneath some of the soot there is, there has been found um, stage directions, so there's evidence that the poems were being performed. Um, then one of the neat things about the, the Edda is that in the 1600s, um, a bishop in Iceland uh, gifted it to the king of Denmark. And um, it remained in Denmark for until 1974, when it was brought back to Iceland. And at the time, they were really kind of weary of air travel, and so in the 70s, and so they they shipped it um, by boat, and it was accompanied by about four warships across the Atlantic back to Iceland. And upon arrival in Iceland, there was um, a huge fanfare in the harbor, kind of to welcome these poems back home. Uh, you don't see that very often. <laughs> they don't drive. Um, so basically, uh, these tales are uh, divvied up into two different kinds. There's heroic tales, sort of Sigurd and the Dragon, stuff that you might be familiar with from Lord of the Rings and Wagner's Ring Cycle. Um, they've both stolen a lot of uh, names and plot lines from this section. And there's also the, the mythological poems. So a lot of what we know about Thor and Loki and Odin come from this first section of the book. And, uh, and another book called the Prose Edda. So I'm just going to read to you um, an abridged version of the first poem. And to tell you the truth, like most of the poems are pretty funny. This one's not. Uh, you know, Odin's come and he's come to this grave mound, and he's risen. He's made a, a seeress, a sort of witch, rise from the dead, and he wants information from her. And as you can imagine, when you raise things from the dead doesn't always turn out that great, and, uh, um, but he wants information about how the world's going to end, and how it began, and he knows that the gods will die, and in the pantheon, the Old Norse pantheon, they, the gods know that they will die someday, and so their imminent destruction is, uh, weighs heavy on their minds, and so Odin's asking her about all of this. The Volva's Prophecy. Shush now, you sacred ones, all creeds of Hendel's sons. Cadaver father, I'll try to retell tales of the ancients and the long-gone gods. I recall being reared by Jotuns in days long gone. If I look back, I recall nine worlds, nine wood witches, that renowned tree of fate below the earth. Ymir struck camp when time began, no land, sand, or sea folding on itself, no sky, earth, or grass swaying atop its girth, only the cavern of chaos's gaping gulf. First Burr's sons hung the earth's shelves, molding Midgard as a southern sun soaked the stone pillars of that place and a lush green grew across the ground. Moon's sister sun in her southern reach threw her right hand over heaven's rim. Where would she hammer her hall in place? The stars knew naught of their jurisdiction. The moon knew naught of its clout. The glorious gods sat on their thrones of fate, and a council was held to contemplate this. To keep track of the years, they named morning, noon, and night. They named afternoon. They named twilight. On Edivolt, the Aesir amassed to raise storied temples and altered slabs, to smithy tongs and tools and fashion precious pieces in their flaming forges. In the meadow, they were gleeful, over board games, their coffers overflowed with gold until three giant girls came out of Jotunheim. 
I know of an ash called Yggdrasil, that one tree, a sky-high tree mired in white muck. From it drop the dews that drench the valleys. It rises always green above Erd's well. And from the aquifer below that tree came three gifted girls, first Urd, then Verdandi, and finally Skuld. They carved wooden slips. They laid down laws, plotted and formed the fates of humankind. I can recall the war. They filled Golveg full of spears, dragged her to the High One's Hall and burnt her. Three times they roasted her, and three times she was reborn. When she'd turn up at their houses, they called her Hyde, a sorceress with foresight, making magic when she wanted, making trance magic. She had a way with wands. She was adored by wicked women. Odin flung his spear into the heart of the Horde, and the first war of the world began. The Vanir burst the Aesir's buttresses, and with war ruins bound across the plains. Wrath swollen Thor alone swung the blows that toppled his foes, not one to rest when, his, when he's heard oaths, affidavits, and solemn vows shattered, all that's pledged between allies soured. Before her eyes, Valkyries arrived from far and wide. The warlord's ladies ripe to ride, Skuld and Skuguld, brandished shields, followed by Guthhild Gondul, ripe to ride over the world. And from the east, a river runs full of knives and swords that's called Slid. In the north, on Nidabella, sat a golden hall raised by Sindri's kin. A second hall sat on Okanir. It was that Jotun Brimir's beer hall. And far from the sun, she sees another hall with northward doors sitting on Nastrand, a hall fashioned from serpent spines, venom falling through its roof holes. And wading in torrential streams, she sees murderers and oath breakers, men who cuckold friends. Here Nidhogg sucks on corpses while the wolf shreds the slain to ribbons. Now do you know or not? Garm howls at the mouth of Nipka Cave. The ravenous one breaks his bonds and bounds free. She is full of wisdom. I can see farther still to the fate of the grim triumph gods. Brother gutting brother, brother on sister, violating bonds and hardening the world farther with whoring. Wolf time, wind time, axe time, sword time, shield high time as the world shatters and no one is spared by anyone. And the upright ash, Yggdrasil, quakes. The ancient tree groans as it births a Jotun. Those on the hell road are fearful as Surt's kin swallows it whole. And what of the Aesir? And what of the elves? All of Jotunheim moans. The Aesir go to council. Dwarves whisper before their stone doors. Those lords of the cliff face, now do you know or not? From the east, him drives with his shield before him. The earth girdler flails, making waves. The eagle screams, and with its pale beak rips corpses, while Nag Fall slips its mooring. From the east, Loki will helm that ship across seas, with Mosfeld's horde on board, all those monstrous kin, along with the ravenous one, and Byleist's brother amongst them. Surt arrives from the south with a branch breaker, the cadaver god's sun shimmering off his sword. Cliff walls smash, troll brides smash, warriors go under the hell road as the skies cleave, and the sun blackens, and the earth sinks into the sea, and brilliant stars scatter across the sky, flames lap against the world tree, flames lap against the sky itself, the hound Garm howls at the gates of Nipha Cave, breaks his bindings and bounds free. I am to the brim with wisdom, but I can see ahead to the gods all lying very dead. 
Then she sees the earth bobbing up for a second time from the seas. Waterfalls gush as an eagle hunts fish down mountain streams. One day the golden game pieces of the gods will miraculously be found in the grass, those that in days long gone were theirs. She sees a gold thatched hall at Gimli, more brilliant than the sun. There faithful folk live, the faithful spending their days pursuing pleasure, and from on high the mighty one will come to reign over all. A dark dragon flaps up from Nidafjot, the shimmering serpent Nidhogg, swimming over the plains, her wing folds crammed with corpses. And now I must sing.